If you were forced to be around a serial killer with no way of escape, you would probably hope that you could be their friend to prevent becoming their latest victim, right? Well, when it comes to Gary Evans, even his best buddies weren't safe. This case is a unique one that follows a criminal's evolution from an antiques expert to an escape artist to a cold-hearted killer. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we look into the case of Gary Evans, a man who spent so many years in prison despite never having been arrested for some of his most gruesome crimes. Gary Evans was born on October 7th, 1954 and grew up in Troy, New York. Growing up in a small family, he and his sister, Robbie, were physically and emotionally abused by both their parents, Roy, and Flora Mae Evans, right up until they divorced in 1968. While Evans' father was known to be erratic, angry, and a drunk, his mother suffered from mental illness and had attempted suicide a number of times. Oftentimes, Gary would see these attempts when he was just a child. After his capture, Evans claimed that his father took sexual advantage of him at the age of eight, as well as beating him senseless without cause. Because of the instability at home, Evans began stealing at a young age to help feed himself and his sister. By the time he was eight, Evans began to learn about expensive art and collectibles. This interest led him to being caught stealing $1,000 worth of jewelry, but due to his young age, he got off with very little punishment. Evans would soon leave home and live on the street, robbing local drug dealers and selling whatever stash he got from them. This marked the beginning of his soon-to-be infamous criminal career. In 1970, Evans broke into a house and was swiftly caught by the police. He spent several months in county jail for the crime, but this was only the beginning of his jail time and certainly wasn't anything compared to what was yet to come. In the mid-70s, Evans shared an apartment with two old neighborhood friends, Timothy R. and Michael Falco, who just happened to abuse and kill neighborhood pets, a common act shared among serial killers. Sharing a living space with these two would have definitely impacted Gary's mind, don't you think? It was around this time that he ramped up his thievery by studying antiques and jewelry further. Evans became really good at pretending that he was an antique dealer so that he could learn about what people had in their collections so that he could later rob them with the help of his roommates. Nothing could stop Evans. In fact, on one occasion, he decided to dig under the walls of a shop because he couldn't work out a way around its alarm system. So, kinda like the great escape, but in reverse. Clearly an intelligent man, Evans was spending countless hours plotting and executing thievery crimes, but his successes would soon fall short in the winter of 1977. With his crime soon catching up to him, he was sentenced for burglary in Essex County, New York, and sent to Clinton Correctional Facility to serve his incarceration. We're skipping over the details of this arrest because, trust me, this is nothing compared to his further crimes. Evans was later transferred to Great Meadow Correctional Facility and paroled on March 31, 1980. His freedom wasn't long lived though, however, as he was locked back up again after being caught with stolen property while on parole. Although the prolific thief was gaining public attention, it was on June 12, 1980 where he really hit the headlines, after managing to climb over the wall of the Renaslea County Jail. After escaping, he fled to the Troy Public Library, where police quickly caught him standing on the ledge of the building. After this stunt, Evans was considered an extreme escape risk and was even caught planning another escape. With all of the escape convictions, Evans was sentenced to Clinton Correctional and paroled from Atika Correctional Facility on December 29, 1982. He would be arrested two more times after this and was eventually released on March 31, 1984. So at this point, you may be asking me, James, this channel is called Twisted Minds, not Sticky Fingers, so why are you talking about a petty thief? 
Well, it was after Evans finally managed to keep himself out of jail for longer than a couple of months that his true nature began to manifest. Transforming an antique fraudster into a stone cold killer. On February 16th, 1985, Evans and his old roommate Michael, the pet killer, robbed an antique collector's apartment in East Greenbush, earning a nice profit of $15,000. In April of that year, Evans stole the car of the two drug traffickers and sold it for $12,000, but the car owners knew who he was, which resulted in his arrest in Cahos. Evans accepted a plea deal with the prosecutors in exchange for his sentence being commuted. He was once again released on probation, promising that he would put his life of crime behind him. But, spoiler alert, Gary lied. During July, Gary built an improvised silencer for his pistol. Despite having no signs himself of being homicidal, one afternoon while sitting inside of the apartment he shared with his accomplice Michael, he coldly aimed his pistol and fired at the man, proving that there really isn't any honor among thieves. He then dismembered his body with a stealth chainsaw. After Michael was cut down to size, Evans called Timothy to help him get rid of the body. After stuffing the body parts into a sleeping bag, they drove over to Evans's sister's house in Lake Worth Corridor, Florida, where they buried it in the backyard. When asked why he killed his friend so coldly, he said that it was revenge for selling the stolen goods and keeping the profits for himself, when, ironically, it was Timothy that was stealing from Gary, the man who blamed Michael. With friends like these, who needs enemies? The killer and his accomplice Timothy remained in Lake Worth Corridor for around six weeks before they left for New York, where Evans was once again arrested for violating his parole and sentenced to four years at Sing Sing Prison. It was here he met infamous serial killer David Berkowitz, aka the Son of Sam. Gary, Berkowitz, and a few other inmates did some weightlifting together with Gary as the ringleader. Murder stories and dumbbells, am I right? It is believed that David's influence would play a huge role in Gary's future crimes, as he would soon go on a murder-filled robbing spree. Berkowitz was eventually transferred to the Sullivan Correctional Facility in the late 70s, but he and Gary's relationship wouldn't end there, with the two staying in contact via letters. Now, it was rumored that the two were a little closer than the typical gin spotters, but the letters that Evans kept after his release didn't show anything but a typical friendship between two men. Soon after his release from Sing Sing Prison, Evans started working with another neighborhood thief, Damian Cuomo. Between March 1988 and September 1989, Evans and Cuomo pulled off many successful thieves and robberies, perfecting their burglary skills. The pair were eventually arrested in March 1989, with police finding ski masks, stun guns, radio scanners, and ropes in the back of their car, but unbelievably, due to a lack of evidence, both were let free. On September 8th, 1989, the pair targeted an antique coin store in Watertown. Unbeknownst to them, however, the 63-year-old owner, Douglas Berry, was sleeping in the back room. Evans, startled by the discovery of the elderly man, shot him dead and stole $15,000 of valuable items. Despite his habit of getting caught and arrested, Evans and his partner left no evidence behind. On December 27, 1989, less than four months after Barry's murder, Cuomo left his apartment with Evans and was never seen alive again. It turned out that Evans was worried about Cuomo because he had begun having depressive episodes and insinuating that he was going to turn himself in and, by extension, Evans. With his freedom on the line, Evans shot him dead and moved back to Florida, but not before spending time with Cuomo's girlfriend and daughter, who he had no idea was responsible for the murder. Yep, absolutely horrible. After several weeks, he moved on to California, where he came across a female acquaintance he had known for 15 years. This friendship 
like all others, was short-lived when he was arrested for threatening her and her husband because the woman wouldn't have sex with him. Since he had a long prison history, Evans decided to accept the proposal of leaving the state in exchange for no charges being pressed against him. On October 17, 1991, Evans killed a 36-year-old secondhand shop owner named Gregory Jobin before stealing a number of items and selling them for around $60,000. He then decided to get rid of his pistol by burying it at the Albany Rural Cemetery in Menins. While sneaking around the graveyard, Evans saw that there was a profit to be made and decided to take a marble tombstone that he later sold. If you didn't know the secondhand gravestone industry was a thing, I guess that makes both of us. After killing Gregory, Evans turned over a new leaf and got himself a job as a laborer. However, despite the sudden change in lifestyle, he was soon arrested in 1994 for the marble tombstone theft and was sentenced to a month in Albany County Jail. After his release, he moved to Vermont and lived a survivalist lifestyle in a tent without a penny to his name. In early 1993, he stole a set of cufflinks worth $1,500 from a shop and later broke into the Norman Williams Library in Woodstock, Vermont and stole an infamously valuable book called The Birds of America that was published in 1827. Of course, Trying to sell a famous book is a pretty stupid thing to do, and this crime caught up with him in 1994, and he was arrested yet again. How many times have I said arrested in this video? Anyways, Gary was threatened with life imprisonment, but since he revealed where he had stashed the book, he only got 24 months behind bars. After his release, he moved back to New York and met back up with Timothy. The pair rented a storage room where they kept all of their stolen goods prior to selling them. Although things seemed good for the thieves, Evan grew paranoid that Tim's knowledge of Falco's death could lead him to snitch. So in good old Gary Evans fashion, he decided to shoot his friend dead. Once again, the body was chopped up and buried in a wooded area. Unfortunately for the killer, the breach of his parole condition, which stated he could not return to New York, didn't go unnoticed and landed him on the wanted fugitive list. By May 1998, Evans was fed up of running and gave himself up at a police station in Vermont, confessing to all of his murders. When asked why he handed himself in, he said it was out of guilt, as he had had watched Timothy's nine-year-old son become aggressive and withdrawn since his father's disappearance. On June 24th, 1998, he shared every detail of his murders and even revealed the burial sites of Tim and Michael. Despite now having five confirmed murder victims, Evans was charged with three accounts of murder on August 12th, 1998. He was then transferred to the Rensselaer County Jail where he was charged with parole violations. Two days later, while being driven to prison, Evans used a secret key stashed up his nose to free himself and leapt from the vehicle after smashing the window of the transport van. He was quickly cornered by the police and the complex escape plan seemed to have failed. That is, until the killer ran and leapt over a fence into the shallows of the Hudson River, killing him. A number of acquaintances, including Evans' own lawyer and investigator Jim Horton, said that Evans always had planned on killing himself. After sending letters that stated remorse for his killings and not being able to deal with a life of isolation within prison. According to his close friends, who managed to survive the friendship, Evans was extremely philosophical and a vegetarian and never drank or smoked. It seems that despite living a life of crime, his interest in stealing fine arts, antiques, and renowned books expanded his worldviews and his appreciation for life, lessons that he learned way too late. It is clear that Gary Evans only cared about his own selfish needs throughout his life, and that friends were just a commodity that he could use to help in his crimes or gain from. If he couldn't get anything from them, he had no problem pulling the trigger and moving on to the next victim. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Gary Evans. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.